States. Uh, Dr. Mark Ledoux is a clinician scientist. He mans an active basic science lab and is busy in clinical practice that includes deep brain stimulation, injections of botulism toxins, and clinical trials for dystonia, Parkinson's disease, spasticity, tardive dys dyskinesia, and Huntington's disease. Dr. Ledoux is internationally recognized as a leader in patient care and research related to Parkinson's disease, dystonia, and other movement disorders. He is a member of the Dystonia Coalition and Parkinson's Study Group, although his lab interests have been focused on neurogenetics and the pathobiology of dystonia. He has used a wide variety of experimental approaches to also study the anatomy and computerization organization of motor and autonomic systems, me mechanisms of cell death and Parkinson's disease, and cell cycle control in the central nervous system. At present, he serves on the editorial boards of neurology and tremor and other hypertonic movements. Dr. Ledoux has been the author or co-author of more than 150 scientific articles and book chapters and three books, including movement disorders, genetics, and uh, models. When not in clinic or in the lab, Dr. Ledoux enjoys climbing, fly fishing, and trekking with his kids. Dr. Dr. Ledoux, thank you for joining us to cover research updates today. Whenever you're ready, the um, time is yours. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Um, so um, we're going to do a, oh, now I've got to go to screen down. There we go. So what we're going to cover, um, Briefly, you've already summarized a lot of this. What does the HDSA do? Uh, most of us on the call uh, have been involved with the HDSA and Huntington's disease more generally for a long time. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the Huntington lowering treatments uh, that are in clinical trials right now. And then also, how can you get involved with HD research? Uh, so in terms of the HDSA mission, um, research is one part of the mission. Of course, clinical care, uh, education and support are also very critical. Um, ultimately, with good research, we can cure the disease. So at some level, research is the most important aspect of this mission. Uh, but until we have a definitive cure, all of this is very important. So how does the Huntington's Disease Society of America support research? Um, well, first of all, they're heavily connected. So the um, HDSA is connected with HSG, which is the Huntington Study Group, and also with CHDI and other entities. Uh, and some of these are listed here. Uh, so it's a network. So Huntington's disease is not dissimilar from other diseases like Parkinson's disease, where you have the Parkinson's Foundation, you have the Michael J. Fox Foundation, you have funding from National Institutes of Health, et cetera. Uh, so there are a lot of players in individual diseases, okay? Um, there's a lot of, I would say, most of money that's coming from researchers uh, through CHDI and the National Institutes of Health. National Institutes of Health is, uh, funding rates are very low, still about 10 percentile. Uh, so uh, you have a, 10, a whopping 10% chance of getting your federal grant funded if you submit it. Uh, so it is quite a battle to get grants funded. So clinical trials. Um, so I've talked about this in some of the previous um, programs that we've had, the phases, and you've probably heard a lot about this in the context of the coronavirus vaccines. So uh, coronavirus vaccines on everyone's mind. So you do these stage one uh, drug discovery uh, phases, you do preclinical uh, phases, uh, development stage two, and then you have these uh, uh, different phases of the clinical trials. So initially you start out with a small number of individuals and you expand it to a larger patient population. Uh, so with any drug or vaccine or therapeutic intervention, even devices, for example, like deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's disease, first of all, most importantly, are they safe? And then secondly, are they efficacious? So the FDA will review data, uh, that's submitted to it and it has to make a decision that a particular treatment or intervention is both efficacious um, and safe. For some drugs, the effect size may be very small. So I'll give you an example. There's a drug called Rilazole for ALS. Y'all probably all know that ALS is a really bad disease and some patients will die within a year, most of them within two or three years after disease onset. 
There had been nothing available whatsoever for treating or slowing progression of ALS until a trial of Rilazol uh, was done. It only sl slows progression by about 10 to 15 percent. So you would say, well, why, why, why the trouble? Why even approve a drug with small, such a small effect? Well, the drug is very safe. Uh, it's usually well tolerated. And the point being is that patient population had no hope. They had no other treatment options. And so the FDA made a decision to approve it, even though the efficacy was quite small, okay? So consider that when we're doing trials for Huntington's disease or other neurodegenerative disorders. So Huntington's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder. In some ways, like ALS, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. So the drug pipeline. So you have phase one studies, a small study of up to 50 individuals. It's usually, in fact, much smaller than this. You may remember from the news, the Moderna, Moderna trial for a vaccine uh, actually only had about 10 patients on their phase one trial. So you do preclinical, uh, then you have clinical development. Uh, you move on to phase two trials with larger studies. Looking at safety, the trials tend to be a little bit longer. Um, and then once the drug has a signal, meaning that it looks like it may be beneficial, uh, and secondly, it, it appears to be safe, then you move on to a phase three trial. And these tends to be much larger studies uh, of over 200 patients, rarely more than 1,000 unless you're developing a vaccine where you may need 20,000 or more individuals. The problem with these very large studies is recruitment, getting enough patients to participate. Now, this was not the case for the Roche trial of Huntington's disease because patients were very interested in getting involved and enrollment uh, was completed very, very quickly. So look at this. This is very impressive, this particular slide. Look at all the drugs that are in the pipeline for Huntington's disease, okay? You see drugs that are in the discovery phase, uh, drugs that have completed phase one, two, three in trials and approved. And so y'all well know that we have two FDA approved drugs for treating Huntington's disease, but these drugs are only treating the symptoms and specifically only chorea. So tetrabenazine was initially approved and then Osteta was approved. So these two drugs, we prescribe them routinely in our patients with Huntington's disease, but again, they only really treat the chorea. They don't help with cognition. They do not help with uh, mood or behavior. Um, so they're limited in the scope of their therapeutic utility. So we need other treatments, okay? And they don't alter disease progression per se. The one thing I will say, however, with tetrabenazine and Osteto, patients with severe truncal chorea, they probably do re reduce risk of falls. You have a fall, you get a fracture, you may e end up in the hospital. So although we don't have definitive data in this regard, there's a good amount of suggestive data that these drugs reduce mortality by reducing hospitalizations from falls and fractures, okay? But look at this list. So if somebody says, oh, nobody's trying to cure Huntington's, I would say, look at the effort. You have a whole bunch of companies there. If you look all the way to the left, you'll see the names of the companies. You see Roche, you see Vaxiness. You see Wave, Sage, Unicure, Ibsen, uh, and the list goes down. So you have a lot of different entities that are involved in terms of drug development uh, to try to uh, cure uh, or slow progression of Huntington's disease. So this is a pretty impressive pipeline. So I think the future is bright because there's a lot of effort ongoing. So some of the studies are complete. Um, you have, for example, this phase two study of SRX246 to treat aggression and anxiety in Huntington's disease. Uh, you have a phase two study from Cigna, which is the antibody. So with a lot of neurodegenerative disorders, not only Huntington's disease, but also Alzheimer's disease, for example, you have degeneration and then you have an inflammatory component in the brain that is actually an excess inflammation and that contributes to neurodegeneration, okay? And then recently, there's a phase one study of SAGE 718, a drug to treat cognitive changes in Huntington's disease. So we have a, a class of drugs on the market for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and there are two main drugs of that class, donipazil and rivastigmine. Donipazil goes by the name. Uh, so donipazil and rivastigmine, uh, 
Donepazil goes by brand name Aricep, and the rivastigmine goes by brand name Exelon. These drugs have been on the market for a while for Alzheimer's disease, but small scale clinical studies have not shown conclusive benefit for patients with Huntington's disease, okay? So they're not commonly used in Huntington's. So there's definitely, definitely a need to develop other drugs to treat cognitive problems in individuals with Huntington's disease. So you can see that there's a lot of variety here and there's an effort, a genuine effort to treat multiple aspects of the disease, cognition, behavior, uh, basic mechanisms involved in neurodegeneration, such as inflammation. So there's a current study, a phase three study, Connect HD, uh, about benazine, which is very similar chemically to Osteto and tetrabenazine. It's a vesicular monamine transport two inhibitor. You basically take the pill once daily for 12 weeks. It's a placebo control study. So almost all studies are gonna be placebo control. This is mandated by the FDA. It's usually a one-to-one -one randomization scheme unless you have a study design that's more complex where you may have two treatment arms at different dosages, okay? Uh, in which case, sometimes it's one-third of patients on placebo, one-third on one dose of active treatment, and one-third on another treatment. So this study, the endpoint, again, like the two other drugs, the major focus is treating the chorea in Huntington's disease. In some patients, Korea is a major issue. In other patients, it's minimal or even non-existent, particularly juvenile onset Huntington's disease. There may be very minimal Korea. So the goal of this is recruiting 120 participants uh, diagnosed with HD. Uh, sites are currently recruiting. This study probably will be completed uh, within the next uh, year and the drug will probably get FDA approval. I, I would anticipate or get approved because the two other drugs of this class actually showed efficacy. This, so this gives us a third therapeutic option. Now we're going to focus on Huntington lowering treatments. So the hope is that this is a home run and this is a summary of all the different treatments that in various phases of development for lowering the amount of Huntington. So again, you have two alleles or two genes. So the typical individual with Huntington's disease will have one normal gene for Huntington. And that gene symbol is HTT. So the gene symbol uh, for human genes is italicized uppercase HTT. So you have two copies. So one is normal, one's abnormal. There are rare patients that are homozygotes, meaning that both of the uh, genes are abnormal, but this is fairly rare. So you basically have uh, a treatment to lower the amount of Huntington protein. So if it's generalized, it'll lower the expression of both the normal and the mutant protein. If it's more specific, it will only lower expression of the mutant protein, okay? The idea with being is that there's a threshold effect. So you do not necessarily, based on animal models, the thought is that we may not have to completely reduce expression of the mutant protein. If you reduce the expression by a small amount, that may be enough to tip the scales in the favor of the neurons. And so the neurons stay happy and healthy and they don't degenerate. So you see here, the second line here, the Roche drug that's in clinical trial. So this, has, this is the study and the drug that has received the most nationwide attention. So this is a mRNA-based approach, okay? It's an antisense oligonucleotide, ASO, and it's delivered via intrathecal. Intrathecal, in this case, is basically via a lumbar puncture or spinal tap, okay? And it's currently in a phase three. So look over to the right. This is currently in phase three. So the thought is that we'll have data toward the end of next year or by 2022 on this particular treatment. And we're gonna go into more details about this treatment. There's another company, Biomarin, a similar approach, but in this case, they're targeting the GAG, repeat region, okay? It's in preclinical development. And then Wave Life Sciences, we were involved with this, not in the treatment phase, but in the identification of individuals who had SNPs that were candidates for this study, okay? 
And again, this is an antisense oligonucleotide treatment, but this one is different, it's SNP-based. So it targets specific SNPs in the gene. So the goal, or in theory, it would only reduce expression of that abnormal gene, okay? And then we have a list of another other technologies. So basically, you can see here that this group here in blue, AAV, adeno-associated virus, this is a benign or relatively benign virus, and you can insert genomic material in there and use it to deliver that genomic material. There's several companies working on this treatment approach, okay? Then you have small molecules. Small molecule basically means it's like an oral drug. So when you go to your doctor, it gives you a drug for your high cholesterol. That's a small molecule. So for example, Lipitor for hypercholesterolemia is a small molecule. The tetrabenazine and Dosteto that we, that we use to treat chorea, these are small molecules, okay? So you can get small molecules to get into the brain, into the nervous system, and bind to specific parts of the machinery that are involved with making the mutant Huntington's. So these would lower expression of either mutant and or wild type Huntington's, okay? There are immune mediated approaches like this one here, where you actually have an antibody that binds. And the idea being is you can get the antibody to penetrate neurons and reduce expression of mutant protein. And then you have the CRISPR-Cas technology which specifically targets the mutant gene to reduce its expression. So you can see that these are to be determined how it's gonna be delivered. And these, a lot of these are preclinical. So preclinical, what you're doing is you're testing these therapeutics either in cultured cells. So you can get neurons and grow them in culture. You can get other cells in the body and grow them in culture, or you can use mouse models, okay? And usually you do both. And then some of the experiments are actually not even using that. They're actually doing it in a test tube using biomolecules to see how these particular drugs bind to the messenger RNA that encodes the wild type in mutant Huntington's. So this is a very brief, this is basically kind of junior high school biology. You have DNA, you have RNA, and you have protein, okay? The analogies to the right, I don't entirely agree with. They're kind of quaint and cute here, but you have a cookbook, then you have a recipe, and you have a cupcake. That is, those are some big cupcakes. They don't look that good either. Uh, there's no frosting or anything on them. The, uh, so the central dogma biology, again, you have the DNA, and again, for Huntington's, you have two copies, okay? Uh, that DNA is transcribed to RNA, okay, called messenger RNA more specifically. There are other forms of RNA, but the, specifically here, this is messenger RNA. And then that is translated. So that stage is called translation. You translate that recipe into a protein sequence into 20 amino acids, okay? So with Huntington's disease, you have these CAG repeats. So a normal person, for example, they may have 16 repeats on one gene and 18 repeats on the other. An individual with Huntington's may have 16 repeats on one of the, one of the uh, chromosomes, and then the other one, they may have 52 repeats, okay? So they have a repeat expansion. So because of that, that protein is different. It's actually larger in size and it's sticky and it causes problems for neurons. So you can see at the bottom there, you see an expanded CAG repeat and you see a larger protein that is being translated. So Huntington lowering, okay? You wanna get rid of the bad cupcakes, okay? Uh, these all look like bad cupcakes because what is a cupcake without frosting? I mean, that's why we eat cupcakes is because of the frosting. All right, so Huntington lowering trials in progression, all right? So again, the one you want to pay attention to the most is the Roche trial, because that's the one we're gonna have data. It's a large trial. Again, it's the phase three trial. It is a large trial. Uh, we were kind of disappointed we didn't get involved. What happened was we were involved with the wave life study 
And then Roche found out we were doing Wave Life. And so they said, well, if y'all doing Wave Life, we don't need to get involved with y'all. And then the Wave Life study was halted. So we weren't involved with either one. So it was kind of a bad gig, but it is what it is. So if you look at this diagram, okay, the way it works is your spinal cord stops at the first lumbar vertebrae. So people have five lumbar vertebrae. The spinal cord stops at the first lumbar vertebrae, okay? Your, the needle, when they do a spinal tap, is usually done at the fourth, I don't know why I had the picture there, because normally we go a couple of spaces lower. We put the needle in, so we're way away from the spinal cord. We're a couple of inches away from the end of the spinal cord, we put in the spinal need, and you just have nerve, nerve roots in here, okay? And that's where it's delivered, intrathecal therapy. So it's either every month or every two months you go in and maybe every three months, and actually there's data suggests that every six months may be enough. You theoretically could also do it by putting a catheter in the ventricles of the brain and injecting it that way. There are other forms of therapy that we use where we're delivering drugs into the spinal fluid and we do it like that. So occasionally there are certain infections in the brain where you can't get enough drug by doing an IV or giving a pill. And what you do in those cases, you actually put a catheter in the ventricular brain. It's possible at some point with this form of therapy it would be done via some kind of reservoir, uh, frequently called an Amaya reservoir where you deliver it into the brain, or you actually can have a pump into that space. You don't have to get stuck every two months. You have a little pump, you fill the pump and it gets injected into the spinal canal. So you see that Roche and Roche Genentech and Wave Life are involved with this. Now the second column here with the viral gene therapy. So if you inject a virus into the vein, it's hard to get that virus into the brain. There are techniques to do so, but they're not been fine tuned and they don't work well. So in general, when you're using a viral therapy, it has to be directed directly into the brain, which requires a neurosurgical procedure the brain has a blood-brain barrier that limits access to neurons by molecules outside the brain. This is part of the problem. There are techniques and technologies that are being pursued to work around this, okay? And a bunch of companies are interested in this approach, Unicure, Voyager Therapeutics, Spark Therapeutics, and Takeda. Small molecules are what most of y'all are familiar with. When you have a headache, you go get Tylenol or acetaminophen, okay? You may have prescription drugs for high cholesterol and diabetes, okay? Now, diabetes is different. You have small molecule oral medicines, but you also have injectables like insulin, okay? So there are a number of ways of delivering drugs, and this is what's important. Sometimes drugs have to be delivered directly into the brain, sometimes into the spinal fluid, sometimes by injection under the skin or subcutaneous, sometimes intramuscular. It depends on the characteristics of the molecule how lipid soluble the molecule is, how water soluble the molecule is, the size of the molecule. There are a number of characteristics that dictate where it needs to be injected so that it can do its job. So Huntington lowering, attacking ribosomal RNA, excuse me, or the mRNA, messenger RNA, with ASO drugs. So you have the Genentech drug and the wave drug, okay? And you have this antisense oligonucleotide. And the idea here is either slow or stop <coughs> disease progression. The goal would be to stop it in its tracks. Right now, patients with manifest Huntington's disease are being treated. The idea you would think, of course, which is logical and everybody's thinking this, if this drug slows or stops disease progression, why don't we treat patients or treat individuals who have the mutation well before they have signs and symptoms that are interfering with their quality of life. So you see this ASO drug, it moved. So basically it gets injected, then it binds to the mutant Huntington so that mutant Huntington can no longer be translated into protein. And guess what? Also the cell would degrade it. Once the cell realizes that that RNA is no good to it anymore, it will degrade the RNA. Okay, so Huntington lower, lowering antisense oligonucleotide. Again, the, this is the Roche Genentech study that has gotten a lot of attention. The initial paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
okay, in 2019. It was highlighted in all the uh, websites for Huntington's disease, so it received a lot of attention, okay? This was the very early phase uh, one, two trial. So here's the data. If you look to the left on the y-axis, okay, you see mutant Huntington in the spinal fluid percent, percent change from baseline. And if you look here with placebo, okay, these are your patients. These are the control placebo treated patients, okay? And you can see the change from baseline. And then these dots are individuals that receive 10 milligrams of the drug, 30 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 90, or 120, okay? So what you see with hard doses of the drug, a somewhat linear relationship with reducing the amount of mutant Huntington's disease, mutant uh, RNA within the spinal fluid and mutant protein, Huntington protein in the spinal fluid. So you see here at the 90 and the 120 milligram dosage is about a 40% reduction. So you say, well, that's not adequate because we really need to get rid of all of it. But again, it's a threshold effect. Maybe just a small reduction in amount of that abnormal uh, uh, Huntington protein is enough where the neurons can heal themselves, so to speak, and take care of business and clear out the rest of the protein. So it's just giving the neurons an assist, so to speak. So this Huntington lowering antisense oligonucleotide from Roche and Genentech is currently again in a phase three trial. Uh, the trial is called Generation HD1. There are 791 participants. So as we noted with phase three trials, the number of individuals participating is very large, okay? This is not quite a thousand individuals. It's well over 200 individuals. So I will tell you, I was very pleased that they were willing to do a sample this large. Um, and I think with that sample size, we'll get a good answer whether or not this is gonna work or not. There will be no questions if it works or not with this sample size. If you had only used 200 patients and there was not a strong signal, then people would say, well, the reason it was, it was not enough patients. There was too much variability from site to site, too much variability from patient to patient, and we need to do another trial with more patients. So this should take care of, answer the problem. Um, so all sites, again, patients were fighting. Uh, I've heard all kinds of stories about patients fighting to get in the study from my colleagues at other sites. This was an easy enrollment. Patients were calling clinic and begging to get involved with this study, okay? So all the sites that I've talked to, and I have colleagues not only in the United States, but all over the world that have been involved with this, is uh, patients were very, and families very enthusiastic about getting into the trials, okay? So here are the arms. You have 791 individuals at 90 sites worldwide in 18 countries. So this is truly a worldwide study. So you have a group that's getting the antisense oligonucleotide every two months, another group getting alternating antisense and placebo every two months, and another group getting placebo every two months. So the question's here. Generation HD, can this slow disease progression? But the other thing when you're doing a study like this, you have a lot of patients and you have a lot of data. So make use of all this, okay? So they're gonna look at, for example, how is the drug absorbed? Is the drug getting outside of the spinal cavity and going, let's say, to the kidneys or other regions of the body, okay? The Huntington gene is expressed throughout the body. How does Huntington's disease progress? So you have 791 patients and you follow over time, okay? So you can look at progression, okay? And then the goal is, if this appears to work, then you'll have an open label extension. So then patients, so all patients would be on active treatment and they will be followed for several years because the question is, for example, if this really works for two years, is it gonna continue working out four and five years later? Is the body gonna develop some kind of resistance to it? Will the treatment stop working? So the question really here is, if there's a detected signal, meaning there's some clinical benefit, 
is this going to be maintained over time? Secondly, the other thing is when some drugs work, unfortunately, the some of the side effects don't appear initially. These are side effects that it may appear way down the road, okay? And that's another reason that doing a post-marketing study or an open-label study afterwards, okay? I suspect the FDA enlist, from what I've heard uh, through the grapevine, I, it, it's unlikely that side effects will be a limiting factor in terms of approval for this drug. Any side effects during the duration of the study, the question becomes, do we see side effects with long-term treatment? We don't know yet. So this is the WAVE trial. Uh, this one is more elegant because the idea here is with WAVE is you only reduce expression of the mutant Huntington. You do not reduce expression of the wild type, at least in theory, okay? So you have to have single nucleotide polymorphism. So we did publish one paper. Uh, it was a US-based study. There was five or six sites in the US and I'm a co-author in the manuscript. It's available on PubMed. In terms of the ability to target the mutant Huntington's using what's called single nucleotide polymorphism. So about 70% of individuals with Huntington's disease have one of these polymorphisms that can be targeted so that you can reduce expression only of the mutant allele. So the phase one, two trial of WAVE antisense oligonucleotides, uh, there were two separate, well, there are two separate trials, precision HD1 and 2, uh, to understand whether these drugs are safe. Uh, these are relatively small studies, okay? Uh, there were results available from the precision uh, HD Two. These were announced in December. Uh, they're available in the public domain. Um, so this Precision HT, H, uh, HD2 uh, data was available from 39 individuals. 27 actually received drug and 12 received placebo. So the bottom line here, this was safe and tolerated, just like the Roche product, okay? Participants who received the drug had lower levels of mutant Huntington, okay, but no change in total Huntington. So it was fairly specific in targeting mutant Huntington, okay. Uh, the results from the HD1, the full results are going to probably be available uh, within the next six to eight months. Now we'll talk about a somewhat different approach. This is via the Uni Uni Unicure. Uh, platform. So this is gene therapy, where you introduce genetic material into a person's cells. This, in theory, would be a single treatment, okay? The drug AMT-130 is a microRNA. So basically, the microRNAs can interfere with expression of messenger RNA so that you don't make the mutant Huntington protein, okay? This is packaged in the adeno-associated virus and is delivered by brain surgery. So, to summarize with this, single treatment, it's a specific drug that is packaged within an adeno-associated virus. It is delivered via injection. Here's the limiting factors with this. You only can inject certain regions of the brain. In theory, you could inject the whole brain. Practically speaking, that's not possible. So the drug would target the basal ganglia, which is, are predominantly involved in the motor features, but for example, cerebral cortex and other brain regions that are involved with behavior and cognition would not be targeted. Unicure, um, they're doing a, a, the, uh, a phase one, two dose escalation study. It's a double blind study. Uh, the phase one trial to understand whether this gene therapy is safe uh, there will only be 26 participants at a few sites in the U.S. 16 will receive drug, 10 will receive placebo, so to speak. Eligibility, individuals with HT with uh, 44 or more repeats. There are only six sites in the U.S. that are being involved. University of California, San Francisco, Michigan, Ohio State, uh, Houston, and University of Washington. Uh, for this trial and other trials, all you have to do is go to clinicaltrials.gov and uh, usually, almost always we'll have a list of participating sites, usually with contact numbers, okay? So patients just, the first two individuals had surgery just a few months ago. Um, they're going to move slowly with this study. They'll do a couple patients. 
watch the patients carefully for any kind of adverse side effects before they move too rapidly, okay? So I think this will evolve slowly, all right? So comparison of these different approaches. The Roche study, which is active, and the Wave Life studies, which are smaller scale studies, mainly being done outside the United States right now, are via intrathecal delivery via spinal tap, okay? The Unicure approach is via brain surgery, but that one's gonna, again, it's gonna move very slowly, I will tell you. Trial phase, the Roche trial is more advanced than a phase three trial with a large number of patients. The Wave Life studies is phase one and two with a smaller number of patients. Wave Life will have to show improved efficacy before they move to phase three study. Uh, the Unicure, again, is very early with only a couple patients being treated so far. So, the, again, Roche study is targeting total Huntington. The Wave Life study is targeting or trying to target just the mutant Huntington, okay? The Unicure approach is the total Huntington's, okay? Now, this is another a totally different approach. This is what y'all are familiar with as a patient or just a general person who takes occasional and something. You know, you take a Claritin every once in a while when you get a stuffy nose with the pollen. You take an oral molecule, okay? Sometimes these oral molecules get into the brain, some of them don't. So let's go back to the issue with allergic sinusitis. So in the old days, we didn't have Claritin, Allegra, and Zyrtec. So what did you take? Benadryl. What's the problem with Benadryl? It's an antihistamine. But Benadryl is not very clean. It gets into the brain. And guess what? You get sleepy. So yeah, my nose is not stuffy, but I feel like I need to lay on the couch all day. All right? So then they developed the more specific antihistamines, Allegra, Zyrtec, Claritin, those do not tend to penetrate the blood brain very, very well, so they're not as sedating. So you can take them, get rid of that congestion, and you're not going to be sleepy all day. Most of the time, that's it. It's not perfect. A little bit does get into the brain, but that's the idea. So what you want here is a molecule, first of all, that's safe, that you can take by mouth. It's not going to cause any kind of gastrointestinal problems. It gets into the bloodstream, and there it gets into the brain. When it gets into the brain, it also has to get in neurons. There are some drugs that will get into the spinal fluid. They will not actually penetrate neurons. Well, you're trying to lower mutant Huntington's. That dog one drug has to get into the neuron, and sometimes that's a problem, all right? So one approach is to interfere with what we call splicing or pre-mRNA splicing of Huntington's. So all genes are made of introns and exons, okay? Then you go through, that goes through a process of splicing. You have pre-RNA, pre-mRNA that forms mature mRNA, okay? The pre-mRNA includes the exons and introns. You need to get rid of the introns. So you could target that particular step, okay? So not only for Huntington's disease, but for other diseases where splicing is important, for example, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that there are companies interested in developing small molecules, okay, to target these specific set steps where you're going from DNA to RNA to protein to reduce production of abnormal protein. Uh, this is exciting. At some level, of course, it would be simpler. It's easier to take a pill by mouth, which you're familiar with, than getting a spinal tap, which frightens some people, okay? Uh, so, Hopefully some progress will be made on this front. I would say technologically, this is more subtle, more sophisticated and more difficult, but if it does work, it would be exciting. So how can you get involved and learn more? So I think now we're in the age of media. Uh, some of it's good, a lot of it's bad. So just be careful. Uh, there's Facebook, there's a lot of websites. Uh, there are support groups, uh, get involved with support groups, uh, educate yourself. I tell patients, don't dwell on your Huntington's disease. Enjoy every day. Have fun. Life is fun. We all have some type of chronic disease. Try to be positive, but also on the flip side, you need to learn about your disease uh, so that you know what's coming down the pipe, uh, what's available for you, what resources are available for you and your family. Uh, so it's, I think it's important to get involved. Uh, and the HDSA uh, is definitely one way. All right, so in addition to therapeutics, there's a lot of research, for example, on 
natural progression. We have lots of data on that already. If you go to PubMed and you put in natural progression of, in the search engine, you can actually put my name in. I've, I'm a co-author, I think, on three or four papers related to natural progression of Huntington's disease. The reason I'm a co-author, these studies are highly collaborative with multiple centers throughout the U.S. and the world. So you have hundreds, usually thousands of patients enrolled so that you actually have a large enough data set to see how rapidly Huntington's progress. So for example, what's the relationship between the number of repeats and the rate of progression, okay? What's the relationship between the number of repeats and cognitive problems and behavioral problems versus motor, okay? Some patients, the motor problem, their career is their biggest issue, and other patients, the cognitive impairment becomes an early and significant issue. And in other patients, the behavior, Cognitively, they're pretty good, but they're getting hard to handle because of behavioral issues, okay? So this is it. these are important questions to be answered and also uh, will kind of inform us in terms of treatments. Now, when you get your blood drawn to make a diagnosis of Huntington's disease, they draw your blood. So they draw your blood and you may have 42 repeats, which is abnormal, but those number of repeats are not the same throughout the body. In certain areas of brain, in an individual with 42 repeats in their blood, they may have 50 repeats in the striatum. They may have 45 repeats in another region of brain, in the posterior parietal cortex. They may have a different number of repeats in the heart. I was at one lecture years ago and said, if everybody with Huntington's, if you treated the brain, by the time they were 100, they would be in heart failure because of Huntington involvement in the heart. So the Huntington protein, is expressed throughout the body. So there are several companies that are interested in studying this more specifically and ways to determine the repeat size in different brain tissues. So for example, if you're using a viral delivery approach, it would be important to target that to brain regions in that individual that have a higher number of repeats, okay? So this is kind of more of the high-end biology behind and science behind studying Huntington's disease. But just to give you an idea, there are other lines of research that are proceeding. So observational studies. A lot of this has already been done, frankly, in terms of op and we have lots of good data. Uh, more data is always good, and there are no new tools to examine the progression of Huntington's. So one, for example, is spinal fluid. There are certain markers in spinal fluid, ID to HD clarity, there are certain markers in spinal fluid that can be used to assess disease progression. And there be, some of these markers can even be detected in the serum. Uh, of course, you can do PET scan imaging and MRIs over time and do quantitative MRIs to actually measure the volume of certain brain regions to look at progression. And then the gold standard, which we've used for decades, is actually quantitative assessments using rating scales, like the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale. So that particular rating scale, we have a score, and we evaluate patients yearly, and we see how that score changes over time, okay? Brain donation is important, uh, not only for Huntington's, but a variety of other neurological disorders, particularly neurodegenerative disorders. And so you can get involved in that way. So there's a lot of ways to get involved. There's a lot of different types of research that is ongoing. Um, HD drug pipeline, clinical news. Um, so actually we were involved in both of these studies, the Legato uh, study, we got involved. Uh, the study failed to meet its primary endpoint um, in the Nepride HD study. Uh, this was a, a drug to see the effect of uh, fedopidine on abnormal movements. Um, the effect size was too small to justify progression. So you have to realize the cruel reality of this. Uh, scientists and clinicians have hypotheses. They may have pretty good data from phase one trials to suggest that drug may, may work. They may have good data in the lab using mouse models suggest it may work. And then you move it into the clinic to see if there's some efficacy and it's just not enough to proceed forward. If the effect is very small, it's hard for the company to justify doing a phase three trial, which is gonna cost at minimum $50 million uh, for actually a disease that's relatively uncommon. It's not like dealing with high blood pressure or diabetes or 
high cholesterol, which is very are very common in the population. So Huntington's are relatively uncommon. So unless they have a really good idea that this drug's gonna be effective, they, they cannot financially afford to proceed forward with these studies. Uh, this is our clinic. Uh, most of y'all know this. We have a Huntington's disease clinic. Uh, we were a Huntington's Disease Society of America Center of Excellence. Now we're just a Huntington Center of Excellence. We have social workers, um, Margot helps. We have Missy that helps. We have a speech pathologist, dietitian. We have OTPT. We do genetic counseling. I'm in the clinic every time. We do referral to outside providers when necessary. Uh, Dr. Brzezinski, uh, for example. Um, so that's our contact information. We're there to help. So we have the clinic, uh, the Fort Wednesday of each month, uh, but uh, we see patients on other days. I have patients that they don't have a ride on a Wednesday. We have new patients trying to get in the clinic. We'll bring them in immediately and we see them. So we see patients uh, with Huntington's disease pretty much Monday through Friday. Um, and I'm always available. And I've been in the community now for I came here to Memphis in 95, so I'm still here. So if y'all have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them. And thanks for your attention. Um, feel free to send any questions to Dr. Ledoux. You can come off of chat and ask them. You can send them to me. Um, if you have a question about anything that he's covered, there was a lot in his presentation. So feel free to ask away. I'm gonna stop recording just in case anybody comes off mute. All right.